heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde of Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, chip design firm Arm surges in the most since its IPO after a bullish outlook on sales. We'll sit down with the CEO, Rene Haas, to discuss. Plus, the mouse house spikes as cost-cutting benefits and international theme park strength boost the company's results. Full coverage ahead. And Apple's limited release of its Vision Pro fetching as much as $5,000 in the resale market. All that and so much more coming up ahead. But first, we check on the macro, on the picture of the markets. And look, we managed to just be pushing up on the Nasdaq, up some three-tenths of a percent. Chip makers outperforming there. Many thanks to Arm, of course. 15,809 is where we trade. Interesting levels for the S&P 500. I shine a light because we are in but a whisper from the all-important $5,000. We're at 4995 as we speak. We're basically flat on the S&P. We're taking a breather after the surge we've seen in equities. And indeed, as we see the digestion on the bond market, we're getting a 30-year sale today after some pretty successful five- and ten-year sales. We're at 30-year yields just popping up a little bit, five basis points as we anticipate that sale. Move on to the world of Bitcoin, because yet again, we're seeing risk asset surge in that particular area. We're up another 2.9%. What does that mean? We're above the $45,000 level. All about ETF flows. But Ed, what have you got on the micro? We're spoiled for choice when it comes to earnings. So Disney's up 10%. It's trading at its highest level in more than a year. And the story is about cost discipline. This is Bob Iger showing to investors that all that cost cutting worked and that the outlook for profit this year is boosted by that. But then there are some specific stories, a $1.5 billion stake in Epic Games. That is going to give Disney-related video game content going forward. And then the sports distribution deal on the other side that we've been talking about with those three other parties, uh, all in all, it gives him some ammunition to go to these activist investors and say, well, look at what I'm doing. Is it enough to appease them? We'll hear from the CFO later in the program. We'll go to our reporter and one key investor to get the reaction. This is the story. Arm, a massive surge in the stock. It's, it's easy to say this is the biggest jump since they listed in September, but we are up 58%. And it is the outlook for the current period going way beyond estimates, evidence that this is no longer a name offering the building blocks or blueprints for semiconductors with royalties and licensing on the underlying code that allows a chip to communicate with the software that it runs. It's not a smartphone story. There's evidence that the diversification that Rene Haas has been pushing for is now there. We are seeing evidence. There are questions around the AI story, for sure. Then look at parent SoftBank. SoftBank owns 90% of the, of the company, right? But they are saying overnight in their own earnings, we are putting ARM front and centre, Caroline, in the, of our AI strategy. What does that look like? This is a wild market reaction, but it's vindication for a story this company has been trying to tell. Absolutely extraordinary market reaction. And on the back of that, we want to welcome our Bloomberg TV and radio audiences. ARM shares more than 50% higher. The bullish outlook is something we can now discuss with the CEO, Rene Haas, joining us. And Rene, you must feel vindication. You were trying to tell this story at the IPO. And boom, you deliver. Uh, well, thank you, Carolyn. Yes, we, we're really happy with, uh, with the results that we, uh, that we uh, posted. Uh, additionally, very, very good feelings about the forecast going forward. But, but as you said, uh, this is really the results of strategies that were put in place a number of years ago that are now just really starting to come to fruition. Yeah. When we think about the vindication, when we think, though, still about basically more of your technology going into more types of equipment, you've managed to see a diversification out of phones. Paint us the strategy of ARM going forwards, because many would say, actually, you're not just well, the overall designer of chips. You're basically making the chips. You're fabulous in some way. Is, how do you see <laughs> that relationship going forward with Qualcomm, for example? Well, a lot of folks, you know, as you said, um, didn't really understand the company well and, and where we fit. And, and obviously, we had a lot of growth attached to the smartphone market. But ARM is in a lot of devices that people may not naturally think about. Uh, we're in a Tesla vehicle. We're in a Ford F-150. We're in a uh, Ring smart camera. We're in a Samsung TV, a Samsung smart appliance. So just about every device you can think of uh, has ARM inside. And just about every device you can think of needs more and more compute. 
particularly as, as AI is now driving a whole new demand cycle. Mm. Talk to us about AI. Jeffrey is really singling that out. The analyst there saying that this really shows you're a beneficiary from AI. But where does the AI focus come? You, of course, were at NVIDIA before. They are all about AI accelerators. And I'm interested as to whether or not that would be an area that you get into other than servers. Well, right now, NVIDIA is a great partner. Uh, their Grace Hopper chip, a super chip, uses uh, a lot of ARM CPUs in combination with their GPU, which is a really, really great solution for uh, high-end AI training in the data center, as well as inference. But when you start moving to smaller devices, say smartphones or PCs, well, AI is going to run there too. Uh, if you look at some of the recent announcements by, by Samsung and Google relative to their smartphones, there's a lot of things such as circling an image on a browser and then having that browser go off and do search based on the, uh, the circle, that's AI. That's actually running in a smartphone. And what we're seeing is really a drive for more and more compute capacity to run these AI algorithms, some that people don't even know what they are yet. But what designers want to do and need to do is future-proof their designs with more and more compute. And that is really driving a, a strong uh, licensing cycle for us in terms of more demand. Rene, we've been at pains to kind of help the audience explain how your business works. You know, the royalty side, I call it the building blocks of chip design, and then the licensing side, managing the interaction between the underlying design of the chip and the software it's intended to interact with. And what you said to the street is, smartphone isn't everything anymore. It's a third of our business, but somehow you're also boosting the, the royalties that are coming in on that business. Just explain how that dynamic is working. Smaller proportion of overall, but you're basically making more money per deal. We've got two things kind of going on in the smartphone market. One is we've moved to a, a higher version of our processor, what we call version nine. And the royalties associated with the version nine are, are roughly double than that of version eight, and that's growing. Uh, last quarter, about 10% of our royalties came from version eight. Now it's version nine is about 15% and growing. So that's happening. But secondarily, people are putting more V9 in their smartphones than they put V8. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it means more processors to handle these complex tasks such as AI. So what you have is a compounding effect, uh, increased rates from the new version, but more and more compute because more and more computes needed to run these complex uh, devices. So it's having a, a real growth effect for us. Rene, what happened in China was a surprise. How long does that continue for? You know, China follows the rest of the world for us, Ed, in the sense that uh, where we're very strong in the rest of the world vis-a-vis -vis data centers or EVs, uh, China follows that. And the reason is that the software ecosystem, which is global, that is really predominantly ARM-based, uh, China partners want to leverage that. And one thing that China is very unique about is speed. They want to go as fast as possible develop products as quickly as possible. Well, the software base allows them to develop products very quickly that the market will adopt. So, uh, you know, there's been a lot written about China headwinds in the market, et cetera, et cetera. But for us, uh, China has been a great market. For our Bloomberg television and radio audience, we're speaking to the ARM CEO, Rene Haas. Overnight, Rene, SoftBank, which hold 90% of your company, said that they're gonna put you at the center of their AI strategy. Uh, how much say are you going to have in that if SoftBank is kind of dictating how they see your role in, in the play out of AI infrastructure? Well, I can speak from kind of two hats. One, one is as the uh, CEO of ARM and the other is as a, as a SoftBank board member. I'll speak to the former uh, primarily here. Uh, we believe that AI uh, is the most profound opportunity uh, in our lifetimes and we are only at the beginning. When you think about artificial general intelligence and what is required to make that happen in terms of compute, power efficiency, energy, those are all great areas for us to be involved in and focus in. So I think uh, AI is not in any way, shape or form a high cycle. I think we're in incredibly early days and I think it's going to have amazing impact on our planet. I mean, extraordinary. We're still just looking at your share price now, rocketing up to about 60% on the day, up more than 70% over the last five days. Are there any areas of concern for you? You were just talking about the macro picture, for example, being in China that actually has played to your strengths, even though the rest of the economy we slightly worry about. China's still a bright spot. What about geopolitics? What about the international role that you have as ARM? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I think 
for CEOs, uh, particularly now in the semiconductor world, uh, the geopolitics, government relations, things of the nature, five, 10 years ago, that wasn't something that we had to worry about a lot. Now it's obviously front and center in terms of how we think about uh, the world. I think for ARM, uh, I don't know that our issues or concerns are any different than my peer group faces. Uh, we all ship globally. Uh, we think the world is a better place when it's an easier global ecosystem. But we're also mindful that we are in very different times than we were five, 10 years ago. Rene, a question from our audience on social media for you. Will you start doing business directly with the software ecosystem in the context of um, AI edge computing? That's what they want to know. We do a lot of business with the software ecosystem in the sense of that they're incredibly strong partners to us. Uh, when you think about Android as a software ecosystem, when you think about Windows, when you think about everything going on with open source software, uh, that is something we are incredibly involved in, particularly from a technology side, because at the end of the day, uh, the, what makes ARM so pervasive, it's a software ecosystem uh, like no other. So software is front and center of what we think about in terms of all of our engineering engagements. ARM um, CEO, Rene Haas, Stock Soaring, great to have some time with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Coming up, we'll break down Disney's earnings with Gerber Kawasaki CEO and President Ross Gerber. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg Technology. The purpose of the venture is purely distribution. It's not about procurement of content. So we'll continue to compete with each other for sports rights, just as we always have. Uh, it'll actually, I think, be a great benefit to the league because it's no different in terms of the way we bid for sports rights, but that reduced friction benefits all of the leagues as well. So I think the leagues will actually be pretty optimistic about this. That was Disney CFO Hugh Johnson there commenting on ESPN, Fox and Warner Brothers Discovery's earlier sports bundling announcement. And Disney shares pushing above a one year high today after topping earnings estimates and issuing an upbeat profit outlook for the year, citing cost cutting benefits and the strong performance of its international theme parks business. Disney Plus subscribers fell short of estimates, though, and Disney says it will invest one point five billion dollars in epic Games. I want to bring in Bloomberg's Chris Palmieri out of L.A. to break it all down. I think we just start with what the streets probably focused on, which is Bob Iger delivers and they like it. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, it was about a year ago where Iger announced these big cost cuts of uh, restoration of the dividend. It was all under the context of the pressure from activist Nelson Peltz. Peltz ended up dropping out the next day. And here we are a year later seeing the results of all that cost cutting. Still a Peltz challenge. Uh, Health says he's sticking with it, but um, yeah, it's, you're, you're definitely seeing Iger del deliver on that, and, and I think he's probably feeling pretty happy about the stock price today. I mean, Chris, he's delivering on profitability, on cost cuts, but ultimately revenue, there are still worries about, well, when they really do see, see growth once again and the subscribers coming back to Disney+, Plus. when we start to actually see a revenue driver coming from the parks here in the U.S., not just internationally, and indeed just the media side of the business, the TV legacy still really hurting. Where was there to be excited in some of these new partnerships? I think particularly Epic Games. Well, uh, for sure there's a lot of negative here. I mean, uh, no attendance growth at Walt Disney World in Florida, basically no growth in Disney+. Plus. In fact, they're predicting a pretty big subscriber gain in the current quarter, $6 million. But nearly all of that is the ones they're giving away, essentially, to charter, although they are getting a, a, you know, a wholesale fee. Um, and uh, also, as you mentioned, traditional TV, double-digit decline. Part of that is due to the strikes uh, in Hollywood last year, but again, not a really good trend. The uh, market did seem to really enjoy this epic uh, investment. It's a big number uh, for a minority state. Uh, but, uh, you know, partnering with the Fortnite maker and getting uh, Disney's, uh, it's sort of a situation where they can license their content and enjoy some upside if, if epic uh, the company appreciates Always about the IP, Chris Palmari. Great to get really a breakdown on what we heard on the earnings after the bell yesterday. Let's get an investor take now. Ross Gerber, I'm pleased to say, joins us, president and CEO of Gerber Kawasaki. And Ross, what were you most thrilled about in this set of numbers? Because there was a lot to digest. Taylor Swift? I mean, this is, 
the Bob Iger effect, you know, where Nelson Peltz can't get his way around Hollywood to save his life. You know, Bob Iger is really the key to getting good content back on Disney, which ultimately, when you when you talk about all the things that need to drive Disney forward, it's all about great IP or great content. And that's the biggest challenge is making great content in Hollywood. So to get sort of like the Taylor's cut of this version of the movie for Disney Plus will definitely move the needle in a huge way. You know, she's a, a phenomenon that's massive. So so that's a great start. And then their investment in Epic Games, you know, the kids play Fortnite, you know, consistently and having an alternative universe that's all Disney characters and all the ancillary revenue that comes with all the purchases on an ongoing basis from the way gaming is done today is not only a business Disney needs to be in, but they're smart in that they're letting Epic do it. Disney's failed at gaming over and over again, but Epic has been a wonderful su success. So these verticals, along with the way they're monetizing ESPN, is exactly what Disney needs to be doing. That's a pretty good summary, Ross, of about seven different stories that came out of that. Yeah. I mean, on the, on the video game side, I think back to 2002, Kingdom Hearts, which was a JV Disney did with Square Enix. I, I don't fully understand, though, how the epic relationship plays out. You know, there's an emphasis on licensing content. I get that. Is Disney saying, OK, I think we better go back big into, into video games, like Netflix has done mm -hmm. on the, the, the mobile app sense? A hundred percent. So it's more than just gaming. It's it's social gaming, which is really, you know, Roblox being the best uh, example of this. My kids don't just play games. They play games with their friends. They do not play these games by themselves. And the, most of the time now they're connecting through FaceTime on their iPads and then playing Fortnite or playing Minecraft or, um, or in a lot of cases, just Roblox. And so this is about getting into the zeitgeist of what kids are doing having a social element to the gaming aspect, but also a way to extend their brands in many different ways through this open world platform. If you've ever played Fortnite, one of the coolest things about it is it's constantly changing the environment, the worlds, and the different characters. And so by building more Disney into this, it seeds the next generation of future Disney users, which has always been one of Disney's great strengths and something that they've lost with their failure to really have any animation hits over the last several years. Ross, Bob Iger delivered on the bottom line with cost cutting, and he delivered growth through the, the parks business. So I'll go back to the question I always ask you. Is Disney a technology company? <laughs> well, Disney is a what I would consider a pure entertainment company that's adopting technology in many aspects of its business. But in its purity, it's about going to the theme park and, and living out your sort of dreams and fantasies, whether it be Star Wars or Marvel or Avatar. Um, it, it's about the physical experience, but then augmenting it with the digital experience. And that's where Disney Plus and the gaming and all the other assets that they're building that are digital are so complementary to the physical assets that Disney owns that are irreplaceable. You just really can't replace taking your kids to Disneyland and any other experience. But then when they get home, being able to get onto Fortnite and play with the characters or watch Disney Plus and, and, and watch Taylor Swift, they've got all elements of entertainment covered. So this is the, a great first step for Disney on their recovery. And, and I think if they follow through with some great IP over the next couple of years, you know, Disney will be back. Because that maybe is where they've missed, certainly in the film studios, part of it. Wish, for example, yeah. really not landing. I'm interested in the legacy bits of the business, ABC, the TV parts that had seemingly been up for sale and then retracted a little bit. What do you see as the strategy going forward, Ross? Profitability. I mean, they, they've managed to keep ABC, you know, profitable. So it is creating cash for them, even though it's on a declining, you know, sort of revenue base. They, they've managed to just cut costs and, and maintain that business. But we all know linear TV is dead and, and the cable bundle is dead. And even Spectrum, which is a cable company, doesn't actually provide cable anymore. You know, it's a streamer now, too. So I, I think Disney's making the right moves and trying to get their content in multiple different platforms, including on Charter, as well as, uh, or Spectrum, as well as, you know, this new ESPN right. bundle, mm. which is wonderful for sports fans. So I think getting IP in the most places possible and having high quality IP ultimately is what the entertainment business is all about. Ross, we just have 10 seconds. Do you increase your position in Disney from here? 
Well, fortunately, I did increase my position in Disney under 100 um, in my fund GK over the last several months. I think Disney is worth over $120 a share, and at the high, it was worth $200 almost. So I think for investors, if you see this stock down at this level, I think it's one of the few values left in the stock market, which is fairly richly priced today. So I think that Disney is a compelling investment and one that we own and one that we recommend. Right. Ross Gerber, President, CEO, Gerber Kawasaki, good to catch up. Thank you. This is Bloomberg Technology. Time for Talking Tech. First up, South Korean prosecutors are appealing a sole court ruling that cleared Samsung Executive Chairman Jay Lee of all charges, including stock price manipulation and accounting fraud. The prosecutors in November saw a five-year prison sentence along with a fine for Lee. But this week, the court acquitted Lee and other Samsung officials. The appeal means the case will be heard now by a higher court. Plus, German industrial company Siemens saw orders largely stagnate in the fiscal first quarter as Factory automation purchases in China plummeted by 55%. The drop offsets gains in its mobility and industrial units. However, the company sees China bouncing back in the second half of the year. And AI disclosures to the SEC are jumping as the agency warms of misleading claims. Just over 40% of S&P 500 companies mentioned AI in their most recent annual report with the SEC, according to Bloomberg Law's review of the disclosures. That continues an upward trend since 2018 when AI was only mentioned sporadically. SEC officials have repeatedly warned companies about making misleading AI-related claims, including so-called AI washing, which could lead to legal action. Caroline. Oh, got to use it carefully, folks. Meanwhile, coming up, we are pleased to delve into our very own colleague, Kurt Wagner's new book. He's going to tell us all about Battle for the Bird and how Twitter's two most prominent leaders contributed to its current dilemma. More on that next. But first, let's check in on the market. And over in Europe, Adyen absolutely surging. So too in American trading. We're up 21%, as you'll see. This on the back of, look, volumes looking better than expected. Revenue during the second half of the year actually being a little bit more of a relief, it feels. After, remember, those first half results absolutely smashed the stock in previous times. EBITDA margin ahead of estimates, too. From New York, from San Francisco, and a sprinkling of Europe, this is Bloomberg Technology. Carlson's interview with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Well, it's going to go live, 6 p.m. Eastern time today. And it's the first interview with the Russian leader by a U.S. journalist since Russia invaded Ukraine almost two years ago. It's an unedited interview. It's going to air on his own website, Tucker Carlson's. But he also, of course, said that it will be airing in full on X. And, Ed, we want to stick on all things X. Yeah, X, the company and platform formerly known as Twitter. Elon Musk's acquisition of Twitter in 2022 was initially heralded by co-founder Jack Dorsey as, quote, the singular solution he trusted to handle Twitter as a company. Just a year later, Dorsey said, quote, it all went south. All that and so much more is unpacked in Battle for the Bird, a book by Bloomberg's own Kurt Wagner, who joins us now. And um, what can I say? I had the privilege of living this alongside you, and I want our global audience to relive that story through your book. Uh, summarize the tale that you hope to tell. Yeah. yeah, you did, Ed. We 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 were in the trenches together on that one, and you know, I really think of this book as kind of two parts. You know, part one was. Twitter 1.0, the Jack Dorsey years, and there was a lot of drama there, too, if, if you'll all remember. It wasn't necessarily smooth sailing before Elon showed up. And part two is really the Elon uh, experiment that we've seen for the last 18 months or so. And what I tried to focus on was was really this handoff between these two people, right? I mean, it wasn't an accident that this deal got done. It was something that Jack Dorsey was pushing for behind the scenes. And, you know, Elon was someone he admired, someone he thought was going to be a, a good steward for this company moving forward. And as you pointed out, you know, I think he, he kind of has acknowledged since it didn't go the way that he had hoped it would. 
when you were in the reporting phase, what was the thing about Twitter's original history or the takeover by Musk that surprised you the most, that you thought, wow? Yeah, I think my favorite chapter in the book is actually a chapter about Elliott Management, uh, the activist investor shop that came in and, and essentially tried to kick Dorsey out of his job. This was in early 2020, right when COVID was starting to happen. And, you know, it was an interesting business story at the time. Uh, but there was so much happening behind the scenes that, that folks didn't get to see in the moment that, that gets covered in the book. And why I think it's so important is that was really the moment that Jack Dorsey realized, I can't run this company anymore. Even though he got to keep his job, even though on, from, on the surface it looked like he had sort of won, I really think that moment you know, sent him packing. And as a result, it opened the door for Elon to come in, right? And I think Elliot sort of created a blueprint that activist investors could take over. And, and Elon was sort of an activist investor in his own right, just in a, a different form. And Kurt, of course, Elon then tried to walk away from the deal, was unable to do so. Yeah. I want to go to almost the play out in the here and the now. On the Bloomberg terminal today, we've got a great excerpt from your book. And really, it details yeah. how in the very beginning, we go back to November 2022, ultimately, Elon realizes that him being unfiltered is starting to impact advertisers. Well, certainly a sales team seemed to recognize that. And there's a great bit right. where you'll say one particular key sales rep that, well, head of sales, really, Robin Wheeler says, you don't want to go to war with advertisers. And Elon says, oh, I will go to war and I win wars. And he's currently at war with them. Yeah, I mean, this is the reason I wanted to include that right at the beginning of the story is it sort of sets the stage for everything we've seen from Elon since he's taken over, right? I mean, that mindset has not changed, right? It just fast forward a year from that when he was on stage at DealBook and he told advertisers to go F themselves, right? I mean, this is someone who, you know, from day one essentially didn't fully understand that there's a tension and a trade-off between his vision for free speech and the fact that advertisers need to, to kind of continue to fund this platform. And I think it's sort of telling that his mindset, again, that first week is still very much his mindset as far as we can tell today. And there's a reason that things haven't gotten better for their business. And he's currently, well, financing others to take legal action against Disney. I mean, the fact that this intertwines yeah. with today's news and, and Disney's earnings totally. is fascinating, Kurt. Push us forward, though, in the here and the now, advertisers that you speak to, we just think about the Super Bowl about to arrive this weekend, the focus on yep. sports. I mean, he was running around the New York trying to persuade the NFL to stick with him, persuade big advertising agencies, WPP, to stick with him. Where do we stand now under Linda Yaccarino? Yeah, it's, it's not very good, unfortunately. You know, we talked earlier this week about sort of the shows, the, you know, Tucker Carlson uh, bringing stuff live, exclusive stuff, it's not live, but exclusive stuff to, to X uh, and others. And I've been talking to media buyers and it's just not moving the, the needle for them, right? And mostly it's because of, of Elon and the fact that he is so unpredictable. You know, he can say things uh, to hundreds of millions of people instantly that most brands would be uh, very reluctant to be associated with. And so for them, you know, Twitter just never provided enough value for, the, for that to be worth it. And I think, unfortunately, X is in the same, same boat. They don't necessarily drive enough sales for these companies that they're willing to put up with the unpredictability of Elon Musk. And so far, there has not been a solution to that. Jack Dorsey's learned it. The market learns it. An extraordinary piece of writing that both you, both of you in the trenches, as you say, but an amazing book coming from you, Kurt Wagner. We thank you so much you. for bringing it to us today. Meanwhile, coming up, look, let's go back to the other world of Jack Dorsey. He quite likes Bitcoin, hey? Well, Bitcoin tops 45,000 as ETF inflows show some steadiness at the moment. Certainly the lack of outflows coming from GBTC. We'll break it down next. This is Bloomberg Technology. a quick check on these markets because look, we've got some steadiness some calmness amid some bond sales that have come through and certainly on the 30 year we do indeed see that these auctions come thick and fast they've been auctioning four week bills eight week bills and we anticipate a 30 year coming in a little bit and currently we've seen some steadiness in the bond market the s&p just 
almost near that $5,000 level. We are flat to down by four points. NASDAQ, though, up a quarter percent amid some stellar earnings that we've seen reported. And we've gone into deep of Disney on Arm, for example. Bitcoin currently up 45,000. We're going to be talking about the inflows that we see into certain ETFs or lack of outflows in a moment. Move on and have a look at some of the individual movers. Because we do want to shine a light on the fact that Arm Holdings is up 53%. It means that NASDAQ 100 has some of the other because remember, it's not on the NASDAQ because, of course, it's only 10% of a free float versus 90% still hold by SoftBank. But it is impacting the rest of the chip space. And so we are on the higher side with the broader indices. Disney up 12% after we see profitability being delivered by Bob Iger. And PayPal, though, on the downside, more than 11%. Look, even though they're still taking eyes on costs and stripping out workers, they are overall still seeing that volumes are not living up to where the anticipation is. And there's some worry around competition still. But for more on these markets, we want to go broader with Bloomberg's Isabel Lee because there has been some fascinating cash being made by these overall tech firms. The idea that dividends are being given back, share buybacks being promised, Disney, of course, being one of those. What are you seeing more broadly as to a desire to get in at these valuations? So that's the thing with tech. They're very expensive, way more expensive than those in the benchmark. But then money managers argue that they're quality companies. Yes, all the Magnificent Seven stocks are expensive, maybe except... They're expensive, especially Tesla, but they're all quality, maybe except Tesla. And that's why a lot of money managers I talk to are careful not to be too underweight tech because they don't want to lose on those gains. But they're also very careful because the unstoppable rally and the relentless rally that we've seen last year, it remains to be seen whether that will happen again. I mean, you can only go up so much. But then money managers have been telling me that it's kind of getting harder to beat the benchmark because the benchmark is not anymore such a good measure anymore of what the index should be because it's so heavy on tech. The weightings discussion is really important. I go back to the, the story we did a, a few weeks ago on where the net long positions were 12 months ago. And the you know big funds just weren't as exposed to tech at the beginning of 2023 as they would have liked to have been. They missed out. And so now, fast forward to present day, they, they want to keep that going. But if we hit S&P 5000, sounds exciting, uh, you know, how much further can we go in 2024? 5,000 is a really important psychological mark. Traders love round numbers, and 5,000 is a shiny new round number, and which is why we're seeing that um, options traders, if you look at the weekly options expiry on Friday, it has seen a surge in open interest. And honestly, it just really shows how bullish traders are, and more broadly, investors in Wall Street. I mean, the economy is stronger than expected. The job market is robust. This fuels consumer spending, which in turn fuels a good economy. But then how much more can the market rise, right? Like look at the S&P year today, that's up four and a half percent. NASDAQ is up five and a half percent. But the equal weight S&P, it's flat. And 12 months back, we have the equal weight also up by just around four percent, whereas the NASDAQ is up almost 42 percent. So the rally may be losing steam. We're seeing overbought conditions. Traders are probably getting tired. I mean, you do, at the end of the day, kind of take a step back. You think to yourself, should I keep on joining the momentum or should I really look at the quality of the companies? And I think traders are being more discerning right now. They've been burnt by not taking part in the momentum. It's interesting, some technical levels that we've been hitting on the queues as well, the ETFs that sort of replicate the NASDAQ 100. Tell us a little bit in the broader context whether people are saying to diversify because we can get very focused on technology pure and simple of the show as we should but diversification is key are people looking to diversify people are looking to their diversify but the tech rally isn't really helping them it's funny you mentioned that because yesterday the msci world index just hit its all-time high and you're like great that's going to be my diversifier but if you look at the top 10 mm. stocks of our constituents of the msci world it's apple microsoft nvidia meta Honestly. alphabet <laughs> yes and this is a gauge that's 61 trillion dollars with 1,500 stocks in 20 mar 23 markets, to be exact. But they sound like the NASDAQ. They sound like the Magnificent Seven. So how do you diversify? And I read a great note yesterday that when you underweight something, it's not your least like stock. You usually underweight the stock you like the most because you can only have 100% of everything. So it's actually a really um, a hard market. But then stock pickers would argue that, no, actually, because we can find bargains. So it's... It's a tough read, but it's really getting tougher for many managers out there. Bloomberg's Isabel Lee. It gets easier for us having you on the show. Believe me, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Meanwhile, risk asset of choice. Bitcoin topping 45,000 for the first time in a month as ETF inflows show signs of steadying. Joining us now, James Seifert of Bloomberg Intelligence. And 
this is how we track it now. You know, the, any given movement in XBT is fine, but I think I'm right in saying that through Wednesday, nine straight consecutive days of positive net inflows into the ETF products. What does that tell you? Yeah, I mean, part a lot of it is just really you can look at to GBTC. Look, the other the, we call it the newborn nine. So it's GBTC and the newborn nine. GBTC came over with billions of dollars, and their outflows have slowed. They only saw eighty million out. We were looking at hundreds of millions every single day coming out of GBTC. Um, it was largely expected. We had a lot of these bankruptcy estates, specifically FTX and other people that were kind of trapped in GBTC that were going to pour out. And it was remained to be seen how much of that was going to find its way back into Bitcoin type exposure, whether it be the Bitcoin ETFs or not. Um, but we've seen these other newborn nine pick up the slack. They've they've taken in flows pretty much every single day. We have four of these ETFs that have taken in flows every 19 days in a row since they listed, or actually four have done 18 of 19 days and two have done 19 days straight of inflows. So to be doing that, they're basically taking in money while GBTC is losing, which is giving us that nine days of straight inflows to these Bitcoin ETFs. There were nine new US spot Bitcoin ETFs. And actually there's been some analysis done over, I think it's at Goldman or JP Morgan, in fact, talking about the liquidity that they're seeing within amongst all the, the different ones jostling for their space. Who's coming out on top at the moment, James? Yeah, so, I mean, GBDC came out on top because it, it for the most part, it's had the most liquidity. It's had the tightest bid ass spreads. Um, it was actually trading at a discount initially, so that was a little bit of a... Uh, uh, tailwind for its performance because the discount continued collapsing for the first few days of trading. But the last couple of days, IBIT from BlackRock has actually out-traded GBTC. And all these other issuers, those newborn nine we just spoke about, their spreads have compre compressed significantly. So initially, it was GBTC was the only one with really tight spreads. Then we had Fidelity and BlackRock catch up a little bit. And now we're seeing everyone else catch up and their spreads tighten as well. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out in the weeks and months down the line. But IBIT is now competing with GBTC as far as trading volume and liquidity goes. James, increasingly the folks speaking to Bloomberg are talking about the halving and they are trying to do the math on it. How big a factor is it for you in your model? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm paying attention to it. Obviously, I look at it, but for the most part, I'm just looking at the hard data of like what's being bought and sold. Um, so we're paying attention to it. So these inflows, if it really continues, which there's no guarantee it will, I would point out that DCG, Gemini, Genesis, um, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on with the Ge Genesis bankruptcy. They have roughly 67 million shares as of September that we know they, they own. So that could be another huge selling point for GBTC. I mean, s selling catalyst um, for GBTC, which would be selling of the underlying Bitcoin. So we need to see what's going to happen there or what has happened. We don't have insight to that. Um, so I'm more interested in that than necessarily exactly how the halving is going to impact what's going on here. Um, the one other thing I would say that I'm watching is we're talking about inflows to these spot Bitcoin ETFs in the U.S. We've seen outflows from Bitcoin futures ETFs and Bitcoin futures open interest. And we've seen outflows on a net basis in Canada and Europe in these Bitcoin and crypto ETFs. So there's a little bit of there's a lot of money moving around here. And it's kind of hard to know exactly like what's what's net new inflow when you look at the entire ecosystem of Bitcoin type exposure. All right, James Hafer of Bloomberg Intelligence. Caroline, what you got? Well, coming up, we're going to look more about overseas movement of money, but this in the resale market and for Apple's Vision Pro. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg Technology. limited release of the Vision Pro headset is, well, fostering a resale market, pricing the device far beyond that $3,500 styling price, and that's overseas. Prices are ranging from $4,000 to even $6,000, with the price shifting on a daily basis. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Mark Gurman for more. And ultimately, does Apple like this sort of occurrence, this, this secondary market flavor? You know, I think it shows excitement for the product overseas, right? It gives them sort of a... A uh, set of data points for which markets are particularly interested in the product so that maybe they could fine tune how they're going to allocate supply when they eventually go to those markets, which markets are they going to approach first. So it's certainly a helpful data point for Apple. Does Apple like it? Not necessarily. I think it creates a lot of complexity. The App Store and some of the features on the Vision Pro require a U.S. Apple ID. 
So having these products operate overseas could create some customer service problems and perhaps create a bad experience. But at the same time, it's leading to more sales in the U.S. And Apple doesn't necessarily care how they get their money for the Vision Pro as long as the units are selling. Uh, so I certainly think it's a mixed bag for Apple, but maybe a little bit more helpful than not. Uh, Mark, you've unboxed your own Vision Pro. You've had a few days of living with the Vision Pro. You've roamed the streets. You've been on the bus. You mean this thing? You've been in... Oh, that thing right there. No props, uh, What's it Mark. been like? No props. <laughs> How tempted are you to resell that thing for $5,000? Uh, I am not tempted to resell it. I'm going to hold on to this thing. There's going to be software updates, new features, and all sorts of stuff. I'm going to keep reviewing it. So it's important for me, at least, to hold on to it. I've spoken to a few people already who are considering returning it, but the vast majority of people that I've talked to think it's magical. Uh, you'll see my full review on the product this weekend on Sunday in my power on. Uh, but, you know, so far, it, I think it's a great experience. There are certainly uh, a slew of drawbacks. There's a ton of bugs. Like I said, it's one of the buggier first generation Apple products. But the fundamentals and the foundation is there. And with the right software updates, with the right upgrades, with the right hardware changes, I think they have a winner on their hands. It's just, it's not winning yet. It, it will eventually. All right. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman. Uh, set the reminder, Sunday, power on, full Vision Pro review coming. Very nice. Let's go from VR to AI with Google bringing more of its products into the Gemini ecosystem, but renaming Bard to Gemini. I want to bring in Bloomberg's Julia Love, who has been explaining how all of this works. I think the story here is that they want to demonstrate that the, the product, the, the tool, is higher end. It's competitive. It is one thing. What's behind the move? Absolutely. I think they want to demonstrate that this is a product that's worth paying for. Um, there's a lot of excitement about the potential of AI, but it's also a cost center for these companies. Um, Alphabet CFO Ruth Porat has said that CapEx will be up a lot this year. And so I think that they're really under pressure to demonstrate that there's a business model for this product. And so in addition to renaming Bard Gemini, they're also um, rolling out a 1999 a month subscription plan in which you can pay for that for access to the latest model, and so it really feels about well, it's the move that's um, you know showing showing where the money is for these products. And basically ripping a leaf out of the OpenAI book on how you make a business model out of this. Uh, absolutely, their 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 product is one penny cheaper than OpenAI, so we'll see. <laughs> <There's me. laughs> Competitive. I do think, though, ultimately, what are the reviews like for Ultra One at the moment? How have people been interacting it? How have they felt that, look, this can be the area that stops the market share being lost to a Bing that's now, of course, wrapped into it, OpenAI? Mm. Well... Google only released the product this morning, so users are still getting their hands on it and seeing how it stacks up to OpenAI. Um, what I'm hearing so far is that the pro there appears to be parity between the models, but um, it's but Gemini is not necessarily blowing GPT-4 out of the water, as um, Google was um, suggesting in in some of its press briefings that this model had outstored Gemini on on key um, key metrics. Google played it a bit safe, let's be honest, for quite a long time. Do you think they now are showing their full hand of how they commercialize all this R&D? I think this is an important prong in the strategy, but more, more will still be needed. Um, I, I, I don't feel that at one $19.99 a month subscription product will be enough to really demonstrate that their years of investment have paid off. I'm sure for many, the fact that you can automatically use it within your Gmail and, and your Google Docs might well be a winner versus toggling between your chat GPT or not. But Julia Love, absolutely brilliant to have you on about the latest iteration and announcements coming from Alphabet in the, in the chatbot wars. Meanwhile, well, look, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. What a full edition it was from CEO interviews to what's happening in terms of the investor base when it comes to Disney. What's some winners we had on the earnings front? Yeah, it's been a wild earnings season. Recap the show on the podcast. Apple, Spotify, iHeart. We're putting podcasts on the Bloomberg platforms of all. Tune in on your way into work. This is Bloomberg Technology.